Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Okay. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, folks are still arriving, uh, which is fine. Um, and, uh, but we, we want to get started because we've got a, a fantastic program uh, for you and, and not a lot of time. Uh, this hour is going to fly by. Uh, Tom's book uh, is really a, a fantastic read. Um, and, uh, but I do think that folks, especially in the United States, are going to find the book controversial. And that's a great thing about a book because if, if a book isn't, doesn't generate a conversation, then it may not be worth reading. Uh, but this is a glass half full story of China's economy and the management of the financial system. And that's offered at a time when US-China relations are declining and attacks from all different corners uh, in the United States of China's system are growing. And the arg there's this argument that China's economy, how it manages that economy is incompatible with the international system. And as a re result, the US and others need to reduce their exposure to China's unique risks. The book tries to answer the question, how did China manage to do it? How have they managed to continue to grow without a major financial crisis? And can they keep, keep it up? I'm going to turn the floor over to Tom in just a minute. He'll introduce his book, and then we'll hear from several commentators, all leading experts on China's financial system in their own right. And then we'll open up things uh, to discussion with our online audience. Uh, you uh, have ways to submit questions uh, through the chat function or through email uh, to uh, our staff who will forward me the questions, uh, and then I'll uh, help uh, moderate that conversation for the remainder of the program. We were expecting a small audience for a specialty topic like this, hence a Zoom room that can accommodate about 500 folks, uh, but we were overflowing. We had almost a thousand people register for the event, uh, and whether, uh, and so no matter what, folks will be able to watch this uh, now or online in, in just a bit. So I'm going to turn things over uh, to Tom. He is uh, Bloomberg's chief economist. Uh, prior to joining Bloomberg, Tom worked as China economics correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, as an advisor to the UK executive director of the IMF, and policy analyst at the British Treasury and European Commission. Uh, he's also uh, an author of Understanding China's Economic Indicators, which delve deeply into Chinese statistics. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for writing this book and uh, really look forward to uh, your presentation and the conversation uh, this morning. Over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, uh, just give me a minute while I, uh, while I share my presentation. Um, now, is that working? That looks fantastic. And if I move it, does it move? It does. Okay, yes. fabulous. Well, look, um, it, it's, really, it's really never been more important um, that all of us understand not just China's economy, but the intersection between China's economy, China's financial system, China business, China leadership, China security. Um, and I can't think of uh, anyone in the world who pulls those pieces together uh, more smartly and more comprehensively than the team uh, at CSIS. Uh, so I, I'm delighted that uh, CISAS would uh, would host this book talk, and, and thank you, Scott, and the team there for helping pull this together. Um, so um, as I prepared to, uh, to to launch my book over the internet, uh, I was uh, thrilled to be doing it with CSIS, uh, but I also had a concern. Um, when you do a book launch in person, the audience is physically there, uh, and they feel a kind of moral obligation to buy a copy of the book. Um, when you do a, web, uh, uh, a book launch over the internet, perhaps that sense of moral obligation isn't there or isn't quite as strong. Uh, 
Um, so I've devised uh, an extremely clever mechanism, uh, which I'm now going to use to try and ensure that I engineer maximum sales from this event. Uh, so before I start my presentation, I'd like everyone to raise their right hand uh, and repeat after me. Uh, I, Tom Orlick, uh, and here, of course, you'd insert your own name. Uh, I, Tom Orlick, pledge that immediately after the presentation, I will order a copy of China, the bubble that never pops. Um, now, that's the compulsory part of the, the presentation, uh, compulsory part of the pledge. Uh, and I'm not an unreasonable man, so the second part is voluntary, uh, but feel free to follow along if you want to. Um, and also one for each of my friends and relatives, and I will also leave a positive review on Amazon. Okay, um, so with that done, uh, let, me, let me jump into my presentation. Uh, so I lived in China for, for 11 years, from 2007 through 2018. And for that entire time, uh, there was a consistent thread of pessimism, even a thread of doom, running through the Western view uh, on what was happening in China. Yes, the story went, 10% growth looks impressive, but poke a little bit beneath the surface and there are problems. Debt is too high. China will have a financial crisis. Leadership can't execute on reform. They're too conservative. They're too trapped by vested interests. The state sector is too big and too inefficient. And China's medium-term growth prospects just aren't that strong. There's a middle-income trap. There's a demographic problem as the workforce ages. Uh, and yet, here we are in 2020, uh, and the China bubble has not popped. Uh, so my motivation in putting pen to paper for my book uh, was to try and understand why. What are the hidden sources of resilience in China's economy? How does China continue to defy the pessimistic predictions of collapse? Uh, and how should that shape the way we in the US and Europe think about engagement with China going forwards? So in the presentation today, uh, I want to touch on four areas uh, where I think uh, we don't have the story wrong on China, but we have the emphasis in the wrong place. And I want to talk in particular about debt, reform, the state sector, and the future. So first, let's talk about debt. Uh, this chart uh, tells you, I think, uh, the way in which most foreign economists and many Chinese economists think about the biggest risk for China's economy. It shows you the ratio of debt to GDP in China. In 2008, China's debt to GDP was around 140%. Fast forward to 2015, uh, and that debt level had leapt to 250%. Now, if we look around the world, and we scan the history books, we can't find any other countries that have taken on as much debt as China as quickly as China has. Um, but we can find a number of countries that took on significant debt, but less debt, less debt than China, and still had a financial crisis. Korea in 1997 um, took on a lot of debt, not as much as debt as China, they had a financial crisis. The US in 2006, 2007 took on a lot of debt, not as much debt as China. They still had the Lehman shock and the great financial crisis. And if we look a bit deeper into China's financial system, well, if we think about the borrowers, we have zombie enterprises, we have real estate developers building ghost towns in the desert, we have local governments building roads to nowhere. Um, and if we look at the lender side, we have the explosive growth of a shadow banking sector, skirting the rules, skirting the regulations, and growing faster than they should do. Um, so if you put all of that together, it looks like an extremely risky picture. But what that picture misses is something really important about financial crises and something really important about China's financial system, and that's what's happening on the liability side of banks' balance sheets. Remember that financial crises do not start on the asset side of the balance sheet. Lehman Brothers did not fall over because it had too many investments in mortgage-backed securities. 
Korea's banks did not fall over because they had too much exposure to crony capitalist corporations. Financial crises start on the liability side of banks' balance sheets. Financial crises start because banks run out of funding. Lehman fell over because the money markets decided they didn't want to fund it anymore. Korea's banks in the Asian financial crisis pulled over, pulled, fell over because foreign investors pulled their money out of the country. What does that mean for China? Well, China has an extremely high savings rate and it has controls on moving money out of the country. And what that means is that there is a continued pileup of funds in the banking system. China's deposit base, the deposit base for the banks continues to grow. And that means the funding for the banks is very secure. And so even as problems on the asset side of the balance sheet increase, and I'm sure that there are a vast quantity of hidden bad loans on China's bank balance sheets, the trigger for crisis isn't there. Um, so uh, the second area that I want to talk about um, is China's leadership and their capacity to execute meaningful reform on the economy and on the financial system. Um, so here you can see uh, China's previous leader, Hu Jintao, uh, and China's current leader, Xi Jinping. Uh, you can see both of them uh, applauding politely. Uh, one of my observations from watching more China's leadership meetings, Chinese leadership meetings than I care to mention, uh, is that the ability to applaud politely for a sustained period of time is actually a key requirement to make it to the top of China's leadership. If you can't applaud politely for a sustained period of time, you're not going to make it onto the standing committee. Uh, that's a subject that uh, I think maybe our, our Western China watchers should pay a bit more attention to. Um, more seriously, um, through the Hu Jintao era and through the Xi Jinping era, there's been a consistent narrative about reform in China, and it's been a narrative about reform failure. Hu Jintao, we were told, uh, is too consensus oriented, too much of a committee man to push through difficult reforms. Xi Jinping, we're told, is too conservative to push through the needed liberalizations. Um, and I think that narrative blinds us to some very significant progress that China's leadership have in fact been able to make. Um, let's think about the two most important instruments for control of the economy, the exchange rate and the interest rate. The exchange rate sets the price of Chinese goods relative to foreign goods. The interest rate sets the price of money. There's really nothing more important for driving efficiency and dynamism in the economy than getting it right on those two instruments. If we go back to 2003, when Hu Jintao was just coming into office, both the exchange rate and the interest rate were managed by the government and set at an artificially low rate. And if you swing the, the, the calendar forward to today in 2020, well, the exchange rate is now close to fair value and moved substantially by market forces. And on the interest rate, not quite so much progress has been made, but interest rates today are substantially more market set than they were 5, 10, 15 years ago. Because we view China's leadership through a kind of red mist, um, I think we are unable to recognize some of the important progress they do make on reform. Um, and that also means we don't pay sufficient attention to their ability to significantly move the dial in managing financial risks. So here I want to talk about China's deleveraging agenda. Uh, in 2016, Liu He, who's the chief economic advisor uh, to Xi Jinping, uh, kicked off the deleveraging campaign. It was a nationwide campaign to reduce risk in China's financial sector. Um, and with that um, signal from Liu He, the People's Bank of China traveled around the country and they knocked on the door of every single commercial bank and they said, show us your balance sheet. And if they didn't like what they saw, uh, either on the asset side or the liability side of banks' balance sheets, if they thought that banks were taking too many risks in their lending or too many risks in terms of the sources of funding they relied on, they imposed meaningful punishment on those banks. 
I remember traveling around Hernan uh, in summer 2017 and speaking to a group of local banks. And for all of them, this PBOC campaign, this deleveraging campaign, had had a meaningful impact. And we see that in the data. This chart shows you the growth in shadow bank lending, the riskiest part of China's financial system. Through 2016, it was growing at a rapid pace. When the deleveraging campaign kicked off, shadow lending first decelerated rapidly and then actually contracted for the best part of two years. We underestimate China's leaders' ability to execute on meaningful reforms, and we underestimate China's, leadership, China's leaders' ability to meaningfully take steps to manage risks in the financial system. The third area I want to talk about um, is the state sector. Um, now, there's really no area where the contrast between uh, the US market system and China's state-centered economy uh, is more obvious and more sharply drawn uh, than on state ownership. In the US, the private sector is a key driver of dynamism in the economy. In China, the state sector plays an outsized role. A vivid illustration of that, consider the revenue of China's state-owned industrial firms. As you can see in this chart, if China's state-owned industrial firms were an economy, they would be the third largest economy in the world. China's state sector on its own is bigger than the entire German economy. Now, in the West, we view that entirely through a negative lens. We view it through the lens of inefficiency and corruption. Uh, and that is not an incorrect way to view it. China's state sector is very inefficient. Return on assets for China's state sector is much lower than return on assets for China's private sector. But that is not the only way to think about China's state sector, and that is not the way in which China's own leadership think about the state sector. So let's take a step back and try and see the role of the state sector in China through the eyes of China's leaders. Uh, and to do that, um, let's, let's hear what Deng Xiaoping, China's great reformer, thought of Mikhail Gorbachev, the great reformer of the Soviet Union. Here's what Deng Xiaoping's son said about his father's view. My father thinks Gorbachev is an idiot. So why did Deng think that Gorbachev was an idiot? Well, one important reason is that Gorbachev attempted to reform the Soviet economy by taking his hands off the levers which controlled the Soviet economy. And by doing so, he ultimately lost control and failed to execute on his objectives. China's leaders have taken a different approach. China's leaders have kept their hands on the levers which control the economy the commanding heights of the banks, the oil firms, the telecom firms, many large industrial firms remain state owned. And that gives China's leaders a powerful lever which they can use to execute on development objectives and on management of the economic cycle. On development objectives, China's leaders can direct state banks and state firms to acquire technologies and put those, put those technologies to work at enormous scale in the Chinese economy, bringing China closer towards the productivity frontier. On management of the economic cycle, China's leaders can direct the state sector to hold on to their workers and to invest when private firms have become more cautious. And that is a powerful tool for avoiding or cushioning recessions. The state sector is big, the state sector is inefficient, but by focusing only on those negatives, we miss the crucial role that China's state sector also plays as a driver of development and a powerful tool that can be used to manage the economic cycle. The last area uh, where I think um, our focus in terms of thinking about China focuses only on the negatives and miss some of, the, some, some of the positives is on China's medium-term growth prospects. So when we think about China's medium-term growth prospects, 
we tend to focus on a few stumbling blocks that China faces. The working age population is shrinking. There is a middle income trap. Perhaps China won't be able to innovate and they'll stay trapped at a middle level of development. Trade wars may block China's access to global markets. Uh, and these things are true and they're real problems, uh, but China also has some very significant positives working in its favor. Uh, and these positives are so obvious that they were obvious even to Adam Smith, uh, the grandfather of modern economics, when he wrote his book, The Wealth of Nations, uh, all the way back in 1776. Um, so uh, I'm just going to quote briefly uh, from what Adam Smith wrote about China uh, more than two, 200 years ago. Two important points. Firstly, the great extent of the empire of China the vast multitude of its inhabitants render the home market of that country of so great extent as to be alone sufficient to support very great manufactures and to admit of very considerable subdivisions of labor. So that's the first crucial point. Because China is so big, they can achieve massive economies of scale and massive efficiency gains through minute subdivision of tasks. The second crucial point from Adam Smith, by a more extensive navigation, the Chinese would naturally learn the art of using and constructing themselves all the different machines made use of in other countries, as well as the other improvements of art and industry, which are practiced in all the different parts of the world. Now, Smith was right on that as well. Um, he was also early. Uh, he was 200 years too early. But when Deng Xiaoping opened the door between China and the world in 1978, and even more when China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, these two powerful drivers of growth came together and China had enormous scale and the capacity to learn from foreign technologies. And when you put these two things together, you have an extraordinarily powerful engine of growth. The question then becomes, has this engine run out of steam? Um, and I think the answer to that is no. Uh, and the reason I think that uh, is because of a comparison between China and Japan. Let's think about when Japan's economy fell over in 1989. Japan's GDP per capita in 1989 had already caught up to the level in the United States. Japan was already on the frontier of what was possible in terms of using technology and becoming more productive. China's GDP per capita today is very significantly below the level in the United States. And for me, that means that there is still significant catch up space. I think in the middle of this decade, it's entirely possible China will still be growing at 5% a year. I think at the end of this decade, it's entirely possible that China will still be growing at three or 4% a year. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up in a second, um, but before I do, let me try and pull these pieces together and apply them to thinking about what has happened to China in the last six months. Um, now, COVID-19 uh, is of course uh, a human tragedy. Um, it is also an economic and financial stress test for the world uh, and for China. In the last few months, income for the biggest borrowers in China's economy, state and enterprises, real estate developers, local governments, has all contracted. If there was a moment where the Chinese bubble was going to pop, it would be now. As income for the biggest borrowers falls, their ability to service loans disappears, and that is the moment where you would expect to see some kind of day of reckoning for China's economy. Uh, and of course, that is not what has happened. In this chart, you can see daily activity indicators that we've built for China and other major economies. And what you can see is that yes, China fell, but they didn't fall as far as other major economies and they've picked up more quickly and are now closer um, to normal levels of activity than most other economies in the world. So why is that? Why didn't we see a financial crisis? Why has China's downturn been shallower and its recovery quicker than other economies? Well, this brings me back to some of those unrecognized sources of strength in China's economy. Um, China's banks, because they are well-funded, 
can afford to give forbearance to companies. They can say, yes, we know you can't pay us back this quarter, that's fine, you pay us back next quarter or maybe, maybe even next year. China's leaders, because they can pull the lever of the state-owned enterprises, have a powerful counter-cyclical instrument. They can tell China's state-owned enterprises, you don't let go of any of your workers. Maybe you even hire some more workers. You don't stop investing. In fact, we want you to invest more. And because they can do that, they can prevent financial crisis breaking out and they can manage the downturn and make it shallower and make the recovery quicker than other economies in the world. That's why I think the chi that China is the bubble that never pops. Um, I'm going to hand back to, um, and now I'm going to hand back to Scott um, to hear from uh, some of our great discussants, um, Logan, Helga, Joyce, and Anne. Look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, really, really uh, terrific uh, presentation, and I think you uh, did an excellent job of, of summarizing um, uh, your book and and the overall story. Um, and uh, really, really appreciate that. And um, I like the uh, you have dry sense of humor, and uh, but also uh, that make points. Uh, and uh, so I, I appreciate that too. Um, as you said, Adam Smith was right. Uh, he just had very bad timing. Uh, and so he may be a, a very good economist, but he'd be a terrible investor, right? Um, so now we're going to turn uh, to our commentators. I would not call this group Murderer's Row, uh, even if they have a variety of different opinions. Uh, but if you were going to form a dissertation committee of the best and the brightest who work on China's economy and financial system, this would be the group. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, uh, a, a real treat uh, to have uh, uh, them with us. Let me briefly uh, introduce uh, them and then I'm gonna turn it over to each of them for, to allow them to offer a few minutes of, of commentary. Uh, Joyce Chang is the Chair of Global Research at JP Morgan uh, and uh, is one of the leading analysts on uh, China's uh, economy uh, anywhere. Uh, she's held top rankings in institutional investor surveys for emerging markets. Uh, and uh, she, before joining JP Morgan, uh, was managing director at Merrill Lynch and, and Solomon Brothers. Uh, Helga Berger is an assistant director in the IMF's Asia and Pacific Department. He's also an adjunct professor of monetary economics at Free University of Berlin, uh, where he served as a tenured, uh, where he served as a tenured full professor. He's previously taught at Princeton as well. Uh, Ann Rutledge uh, is a founding principal of the 20-year-old credit ratings advisory firm, Credit Spectrum. Uh, she's an expert on the logic of capital market development, has testified before the U.S. Senate, uh, been advisor to Hong Kong monetary authorities, and uh, is just one of the leading experts on uh, all issues related to credit. Uh, Logan Wright is director at, at Rhodium Group, leads the firm's China market research. He's also uh, non-resident adjunct fellow with us in the trustee chair at CSIS. Uh, previously, Logan was head of China research for Medley Global Advisors and China analysts with Stone and McCarthy Research Associates, both in Beijing. And he is joining us uh, from Hong Kong uh, today. So I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Joyce first, uh, then Helga uh, Ann, and Logan in that order. And uh, then we will uh, look at questions uh, from the audience. So Joyce, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Scott. It's a real pleasure to be here with you, Scott. And I also want to congratulate you on all the work that you've been doing looking at the tech issues. I mean, we look at your work very closely and with such a great group of panelists. But I really want to be here to congratulate Tom, because as somebody who has looked at China for the last three decades, I highly recommend this book because it really goes through the four different um, stages of the cycle that China is in and what they have learned from each stage of the cycle that has um, caused them to really take a more gradualist approach. And there's a few things that Tom um, highlights that I think are worth emphasizing. First of all, that China has never experienced an economy-wide 
door shut panic. Um, you know, and I think the other thing that stands out from this book is how much trying to learn from the Asia financial crisis. Now, that's been a list by the global financial crisis, you know, the great recession that we're in right now, but trying to learn some very important lessons. And I think that um, Tom very clearly points out that, um, you know, this is not Japan. Um, you know, Japan ran a surplus after their bubble collapse, and China is running a deficit this year that's going to be 15% of GDP. Many advanced countries are in that same category. It's also not Korea, because Korea had a reliance on exports that was similar, but foreign firms played a very major role, and China's been managing this very gradually. So a um, very insightful book for just what it says about what China has learned from past crises in the region, and also how it's managed its different stages of the cycle. Um, I'd like to just make three points on how we're seeing China right now, talk about the current and the medium term forecast that JP Morgan has, why we do agree that China's on a path for self-sufficiency and some of the geopolitical risks we're monitoring. So we do think that um, China is having a V-shaped recovery this year. We've actually taken up our China forecast. We have it at 2% this year. We had it below 1%. We have the rest of the world, we have the global economy contracting 4%. So 2% growth in China, and next year in 2020, we have China growing at over 8%. Um, I think I've been very amazed by how quickly they've actually been able to return to some type of normalcy. I don't think this can re be replicated elsewhere, just given China. Is, um, you know, ability to control so many parts of its economy. But I think China has norm, enormous sources of strength. Tom outlines this in his book, the stable funding from the financial sector, a single party that can marshal resources. We do see them doing an enormous stimulus this year um, and you know, a, a fiscal deficit that will be um, you know, north of 15% of GDP. But I would just say this, I'm, I agree it's a bubble that never pops, but if it were to pop, the rest of the world would also pop. We estimate that every one percentage point decline in China's growth takes about 0.4% off of global growth and as much as one to one in the commodity exporting emerging markets countries in Latin America. But um, the, the important thing that I would say is that we do see China's growth slowing, but what we are looking at is something you know, more in the range of four to four and a half percent um, at the end of the decade, not something that um, is a, a, a collapse. Um, we also have global growth coming down just off of the costs um, of this crisis. And on average, we see public sector debt rising. Um, across the globe, but around 15 to 20 percentage points. So China has a debt problem, but the rest of the world is also going to come out of this with a lot of debt. The second point I would make is just on self-sufficiency. We think that China is actually very well placed to achieve self-sufficiency and global leadership in certain um, areas. Um, and I would just say that um, we think that China has already attained self-sufficiency in most consumer tech areas that have been growing as national security concerns. Um, there's been an increased importance on the tech infrastructure. They've upgraded a lot of their homegrown um, tech supply chains to higher value areas. And I don't think it's that easy to move the supply chain. But we do see in tech, telecommunications, AI, fintech, the internet, and also in clean energy, where there's a true need in China, um, where they will have self-sufficiency by 2030, making it, I think, harder to make the case that China you know, is a bubble that will pop um, that quickly. Um, I'd like to just conclude, ju though, just with a few of the things that we are watching on the geopolitical side and the geopolitical conflicts, because I do think there are red lines in China's mind. And what are those red lines? Um, the national security legislation by that the NPC um, has amended into the basic law of Hong Kong SAR. Um, I think a tougher stance towards Taipei, um, the territorial disputes in the South China Sea. Also, um, you know, they want to remain a key player in the Korea Peninsula. And I think that they also are very much advocating their approach to um, how they're fighting epidemics um, and pandemics um, as um, a, a better model for the world. But um, I do agree with, China, with um, Tom that China um, is a bubble that um, never pops. And if it were to pop up, there would be many other things that would be popping first. Mm. Uh, thank you, Joyce. Really appreciate that. Let's turn to uh, Helga now. All right. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Scott, you can hear me? Yes. Yes. Super. Okay. So, Tom, this is a fantastic book. Um, um, you know, I already told you earlier, I actually bought it um, um, 
even though I didn't have to. And so I didn't have to take the pledge. Um, I think it has important messages for China today. Um, but I think it's also, um, you know, um, less in humbleness if somebody like you who knows the country so well says there's still a lot to learn and look back, look, is looking back to history to do it. Um, I think we all need to. And what I like, just as an aside, is that you're describing a very complicated subject um, where many things are interacting to form the whole. And it's really hard to think about general equilibrium, but it's even harder to write clearly about it, and that's what you're doing. So I, I, I think it's a fantastic book. I, you know, I'm with you when you describe sort of the strength of China. It's important not to underestimate the country, its potential to growth, the ability of its policymakers to, um, you know, to at least crisis manage, even though you know sometimes um, you know, you know, there's not, not a big plan. Uh, you point to all the right places, size and scale, potential to grow, high saving rates. And I like sort of the stress um, that you put on the ability of policymakers to act decisively and flexibly. And I think the COVID um, sort of episode is, uh, is important here. However, the COVID episode also has a reminder that some of these strengths that China has um, may ultimately sort of lead to more binding uh, economic uh, budget constraints. And while China is a large economy and an important economy and has very talented policymakers, you know, economics also apply to that country. Um, uh, budget constraints matter. And uh, let me just stress some of these um, um, issues there that I feel in your overall summary, you know, leading to the um, very optimistic um, bubble that never pops um, a headline that's still on the on this on the screen, um, you know, get a little bit a little bit um, underrated. So um, there there are basically two broad areas I think. One is um, that uh, that that ability to have all hands on deck and tackle any problem anytime, you know, in a top down approach is an asset, of course. Um, it is an asset right now, but it also comes with risks. You yourself point to the overshooting uh, that can happen if you um, put all um, uh, your eggs in one basket and, and the, the stimulus after the global financial crisis is a good example of it, went way too far, at least with hindsight, we know that, and brought a lot of problems sort of um, and narrowed policy space going forward. Um, you're well aware of it, I'm just stressing it. I'm also, you know, you, you, have a, you have an episode where you discuss um, uh, in the book the one-child policy and that as an example of longer-term rigidity. The system is flexible at times, but at other times it isn't. And so on the policymaking part, um, you know, it's important that policymakers sort of, you know, are indeed as flexible as you say. The bigger point for, for me, and that's not because my paycheck is you know, coming from the IMF and we are paid to worry about risks, um, um, you know, it, it is because I, I feel these are points that are worth stressing. So my main point is economic budget constraints matter also for China. And the policymaking elite has to step up and face this. Um, otherwise, uh, we will not see the, the optimistic growth going forward at the 4 to 5% level that Joyce was talking about. Um, aging is important. Uh, falling investment efficiency is important. You have great numbers in your book um, uh, that stress that. The, um, but let me stress in this area the, the access to technology. It is true that China has made great leaps here. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and Joyce uh, cited a couple of areas where this is the case. But it's also important to remember that in the waste majority of industrial sectors, China is still significantly below the, the global frontier in terms of technology. Now, that has an impact on productivity, that has an impact on growth. So, enormous potential for reforms if you actually pick them up. Savings. It's good to have ample savings, but it's not healthy to have savings at the national level of 45% of GDP. It's just not. Um, so um, there are inefficiencies that lead to this. There, there are inefficiencies that come from it, and, and they have to face it. Debt levels are way too high. Um, you, uh, you know, uh, Tom put out that you know a probably black color chart. Um, on debt, but just you know, narrow this down a little bit. Talk about corporate debt. So the country has between 130, 170 percent of GDP corporate debt. That depends on what you assume what a corporation is at the local government level. Um, every other country on the planet, on average, is around 90 percent. That's advanced economies, emerging economies. You see the tension that needs um, that needs tackling. So my appeal to uh, to the readers of the book is 
take all that um, uh, material that's there, but you know, focus on you know chapter eleven, I believe, um, uh, where Tom is um, um, a game war gaming a crisis, uh, and there are some of these um, issues that he himself has described are are uh, uh, listed that need to be taken uh, up by these policymakers. They are strong, they are flexible, but they have their work cut out for them. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you, Helga. Let's turn now to Anne. Now I'm not mute. First, I want to express my evergreen gratitude to Scott Kennedy and CSIS for including me and in my views on China and finance, which you do frequently and liberally. Um, and I take the pledge. I really like Tom's book very much. I want to read it again. Um, I, he deserves to be paid for it. And Oxford University Press is a great press. They also deserve the income. So at, at, a, at a professional and a personal level, I like this book. Um, the first, I think it shifts the dialogue about China's economy in three important ways. But before I say that, the first thing I want to say is by walking us through the four cycles uh, of China's financial history through China 2025, Tom motivates thinking about financial history as a continuous process. I lived through a lot of this history personally, and this narrative has integrity. It's kind of eerie and kind of liberating to read another person's narration of my private experience. So I'll just say I arrived in Hong Kong 10 days before Mao died, and I lived in Hong Kong through the fall of the Gang of Four there. As a practitioner and reader of the Chinese press, I knew the credit market backstory of Tiananmen, the first cycle. I worked, and, and that is a story that is, has not been well told. This is the first time that I've actually see, seen it well laid out. I worked in the Hong Kong Futures Exchange during the second cycle, and Tom's retelling is faithful to my experience there too. The perspective of the book skirts the false choice of free market versus state authoritarian capital models that we usually read in US-centric economic studies and moves it towards a more China-centric narrative. I think that's hugely valuable. Um, as Tom just said, it rolls back some of the red mist. Um, I kept skipping ahead to see if the story ends with a definitive pronouncement about why the bubble hasn't burst, but maybe a point of the book is also that bubbles are in the eye of the storyteller. One person's bubble is another's garden variety economic dysfunction. And we, every, every nation has those. It adjusts the lens from an economic story to a financial story. That's also very valuable. China's financial narrative is a difficult story to tell, as, as Joyce and, and uh, Helga have both said. And I think Tom does a great job in pointing up social differences, especially between how the US and China understand finance. I say social rather than cultural because finance experts have their own culture. They speak a special, of langu lang special language of money that transcends you know, whether you're operating in finance in China or the US, as I'm sure Tom knows well. Um, everybody reads Bloomberg. It is truly a language because it allows us to debate ideas. Now, vigorous debate is lacking in the culture of finance, but I think this says more about the parochialism of the practitioners than it does about what finance can do. So hooray for new paradigms. If they come from China, the more the better. Finance benefits from competition, competition and ideas. But I would say from, from my ex experience, both professional and, and personal, that financial system evolutionary history is as complicated as it is dynamic. Um, you know, in Zhengzhou, I ate goat stew from an open cauldron near the railroad station in Aglitihu when I visited in 1979. And I was there again when the first commodities exchange opened in 1990. And I'm going to actually bring up a slide on this because it illustrates a point, if I can. Okay, we'll go to the second slide. This is the opening. Can you all see it? Yes. This is the opening of the Zhengzhou Commodities Exchange. First, you see the clock before it opened on the very first day. You see the rapt and happy faces of the floor traders. And then you see the observers up in the observation deck five minutes after the market launched successfully. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that we forget is that, I'll stop my share. One of the things that we forget is that this is, this is also the real finance. Now, China, if we were going to tell the story of of China's evolution, we would also talk about all the exchanges. It has thousands of exchanges trading thousands of different assets. Um, 
Another point that, that uh, I mean, that, that's not for Tom to do, but, but I want to talk a little bit about a theme that I think did belong in, in the telling, and that is the role of the shadow market. Tom does a great job of talking about interest rate issues, which are very complicated, and the role of real estate. Um, and he talks about the Asian financial crisis and lessons learned with respect to exchange rate controls, but securitization played a very large role in the Asian financial crisis too. China now has the second largest securitization market in the world. Is this gonna become a bubble? China and the US have both embarked on financial policies that are designed, I think, to eliminate rather than harness financial opportunism. The, the glint that you saw in the eyes of the traders, the floor traders, that's what I mean by financial opportunism. Neither one gets it right. Neither the US nor China gets it right. And I think that's very apparent to a neutral eye, but the shadow market holds the key. Um, and I would just leave with a comment. I, I somewhat disagree with Tom's thesis about where bubbles begin. I think they begin on the asset side of the balance sheet. Banks don't run out of funding. It's, it's that it's economies that run out of intangible value to monetize. And the generation of intangible value is a function of information quality. And I think this is an area where we all have a lot to learn still. Thanks. Thanks, Ann. Really appreciate that. Uh, let's go now to uh, Logan Wright. Um, thanks for Thank joining you. us, Logan. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Tom, and really appreciate the, um, the invitation. And Tom, just want to say, join the uh, calls of congratulations for, for this book. Um, it's, you know, it's a very impressive uh, coverage of a wide range of events throughout China's financial history. And you know, what I found it most impressive was it really integrates a lot of the political insights and some of the key events within China's economic history together. And I've seen very few books even really attempt this. Um, I also found you know, this discussion of the debt dynamics in terms of borrowers dividing up the borrowers and lenders and then telling the history. Uh, was a very novel way of addressing um, you know different actors within the system and you know really innovative so um, some of the anecdotes here are great particularly when you're talking to Wenzhou entrepreneurs and borrowers and you know a lot of the other integrations of you know contemporary references to Chinese literature for example so I'd highly recommend everyone pick up this book um, it's you know within finance books our field is generally fairly boring um, it's difficult to uh, actually slog through many different, uh, you know, many different titles. Um, it's very refreshing to read something that's far more polymathic and, and interesting. So um, would heartily recommend everyone uh, listening to, to, pick up, uh, to pick up Tom's book. I focus my, my comments on the substance in sort of two areas. One's on the deleveraging campaign um, that you describe, and I would have a slightly different interpretation of it that I, I think I'd like to, to ask you to sort of react to. Uh, and the second is on the nature of, of state capacity um, as you're describing it. You know, I, I think the deleveraging campaign is being described with a bit of, um, you know, it's being described as if it was somewhat costless in this telling. And I, I think it's actually still an ongoing development in terms of the crackdown on credit that's shadow credit that's underway. And I would argue it has not been costless. Uh, what's really happened is sort of a substitution of some of the funding side risk for a slowdown in economic growth, which is exactly what's taken place. China hasn't really avoided the trade-off here. Um, just more risks are now materializing within the banking sector themselves in the form of, of credit risk. And one of the reasons for that is um, shadow lenders, broadly speaking, there is a lot of speculative activity, but they do fund the real economy. Um, and there are ways of many shadow lenders are basically um, engaging in that activity to hide non-performing loans for the formal banking system or to violate credit policy to get around restrictions on lending to property developers or local government financing vehicles or something of that nature. Um, our own analysis demonstrates that it's about at least, we can demonstrate that at least 52% of non-bank financial institution assets um, are basically standard credit or sort of non-standard credits. And that's probably conservative. So the point was this really does have an impact on growth. And in 2018, it had a, a very sharp impact on growth. Um, you basically the impact was that 
corporate credit growth was cut more than in half, probably by about two thirds. And you know, there's really no nuance to that approach. It, it, I would argue it actually highlights some of the bluntness of the the approach that that China took that China took, rather than um, you know a statement about uh, state capacity overall. And if you look at industrial output in 2018, for 70 out of the 103 indicators that China publishes formal data for, um, they declined outright in year-on-year -year terms. And a weighted average builds you about you know, a six to seven percent uh, fall in industrial output overall, and policymakers were forced to respond. You know, we're also seeing since that time new credit risks materialize within the system, and including on the liability side of banks' balance sheets. Um, the Baoshang Bank failure in 2019 was largely the byproduct of certainly a corruption investigation and uh, had political overtones. Um, but was largely the byproduct of um, an excess of shadow lending. And the PBOC made the decision to basically impose some costs on um, lenders that were expanding using uh, the shadow using uh, the shadow liabilities. But at the same time, after that failure took place, uh, we ended up seeing a variety, you know, a watershed in terms of new credit risks. SOE started defaulting. Local governments couldn't protect their own SOEs, and other banks started seeing interbank funding being withheld. Um, trust companies, even this year, are facing protests outside their front doors. You know, four of them in the last three months alone. Uh, two smaller banks faced bank runs just just over the past weekend. So, um, you know, I'm interested in your reaction to this interpretation. The deleveraging campaign is as less um, as less costless, uh, so to speak, and how it might change your perception of state capacity. Um, the second set of comments is on crisis management in general. Um, you know, you place emphasis on the savings rate, you know, rightfully so, uh, but it's really hard to redirect savings in a crisis. And I think you're completely correct to focus on the funding side of banks' balance sheets. But as I said, those are sort of eroding. Um, you know, I think the the interesting thing here is that if if the PBOC can always inject liquidity to manage a crisis. But unless this crisis is acknowledged um, as a crisis, and China might not ever actually acknowledge a crisis, they don't necessarily have that capacity to do so. So I think the argument relies a lot on government creativity. Um, so I just put this emphasis, you know, these questions to you. you know, does, can you really deploy crisis management tools if you're never going to admit that you are ha facing a crisis itself? And if you do so, doesn't that make it look like a financial crisis? Uh, and the second is government creativity really has clear limits. You know, if property prices are down 30 to 50 percent, which seems, you know, within the realm of possibility um, in the future, uh, given the imbalances within the property sector, uh, are there tools that China can use that other countries can't when you're dealing with problems of, of this magnitude? Um, I'll stop there, but thank you very much. Really terrific. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Logan, really appreciate it. Um, I, as I told you, told everyone at the beginning with my warning is uh, that we would, um, this hour would fly by. We still have uh, about eight or nine minutes left and I'm willing to go a, a, a few minutes longer because this is such a, a rich conversation prompted by a terrific book. Uh, I said the commentators might be considered as like a dissertation committee and, and everything that I heard from them uh, was that uh, at the end of the day they'd sign off uh, that form that circulated in the room uh, and uh, with flying colors, right? Uh, they obviously have, there's, but it's not to say that everyone agrees on everything, but what we have is a very important conversation where we've highlighted what the true uh, uh, areas of debate that are that are needed to engage. Uh, while we've been uh, listening, uh, our audience has been submitting questions, uh, which I've collected, and uh, they come in sort of three groups. And what I wanted to do is sort of mention some of these, and I want to then turn, give Tom a few minutes to pick and choose amongst them, and then actually then go back through our commentators in reverse order, uh, Logan, Ann, Helga, and Joyce, uh, for some final reactions from their side as well. Um, but, uh, and Tom, I know uh, we're, we're 
try and don't feel like we're putting too much on your plate. Really, uh, just this is the start of the conversation, not the end. So uh, from our audience, sort of three, as I said, three kinds of questions. The first has to do with um, China's system uh, and whether or not it's too brittle. And we heard some of that from the commentators. Uh, but you know, in your telling, Xi Jinping still seems relatively pragmatic. Uh, the system seems adaptable. Um, it, can you d explain that a little bit further? Second type of questions had to do with sort of uh, whether or not the description of China's economic performance um, is, is overly rosy. And, and they point to, people ask about China's technology abilities, questions about debt and productivity, uh, and what can you say about what is the proper standard to judge China's economic performance? And third are questions about uh, uh, U.S.-China relations in the international system, a Cold War, um, you know, what happens if, if the U.S. tries to lock China out of SWIFT or really clamps down on technology much further than it's done so far? Is this really going to constrain China and, and, and uh, lead to a popping of, of the bubble? So let's turn things back to you uh, Thank uh, and uh, get some initial reactions from the commentators and from our audience questions. Tom? Thanks very much, Scott, um, and uh, thanks very much to, to all of the uh, discussants. Um, uh, I think all of you got the, uh, the balance between effusive and undeserved praise uh, and gentle but completely correct pushback uh, really, uh, really completely right. Um, so um, thank you for that. Um, so let me, let me try and take on uh, a few of these. Um, so, um, so first of all, uh, to, to Logan's point um, on the costs of deleveraging. Um, so uh, I think that's completely right. Deleveraging uh, has not been a painless or a cost-free process. Um, and it's certainly true that if we look at alternative indicators, China's growth in 2016, 2017, 2018 may well have been significantly below what the official data suggest, kind of macro cost of deleveraging. Um, the point I would make, though, um, is that the fact that China's leaders were willing to embark on a painful deleveraging campaign is itself uh, an evidence of their willingness to grasp the nettle, right? Um, what are the choices? The choices are don't delever, continue growing really fast, but then have a financial crisis or attempt to manage the problems and take some costs now. Um, most economies around the world go for option two, right? They let things run and then they have a crisis. China moved early and accepted some costs. So I think that in itself goes to some of the, the strengths of the Chinese economic and financial system. Um, Anne, I thought, made a really interesting point about where financial crises come from, and they come when we run out of intangible value for the financial system to monetize. Um, and I think what that speaks to um, really is a question about China's underlying growth story, right? So if we really think that China's growth story is over, then yes, we would be extremely worried about a financial crisis because the resources which banks, corporations, and government have to paper over the cracks would be flat or even shrinking. And that's when the crisis happens. Um, so underpinning some of my optimism um, is that more positive longer term view on China's outlook, uh, forecasts for China's growth, which I think is sort of broadly in line with where Joyce's numbers came in on where China would be in 2030 uh, and where uh, Helga's IMF numbers would come in uh, for China around 2030. I don't think China has run out of intangible value to generate. Um, so uh, we had a question from the audience about brittleness um, and uh, we didn't get to talking about the, the sort of the social side of, of China. Um, but I think this is also an area where we underestimate the robustness, right? Um, for as long as I've been thinking and writing about China, uh, there's been a story that there's been a kind of a Faustian pact between the Chinese people and the Communist Party, right? Uh, you give us growth and we will give you control and we won't contest that control. Um, and the story has always been, well, if growth disappears and unemployment rises, then look out because there's going to be social instability. And that's why China is so determined to grow at 8% a year 
uh, even though there's these costs in terms of increasing imbalances. Well, in the first half of 2020, we've had a stress test on that as well, right? Um, the economy has shrunk 6.8%. Household income has contracted. Unemployment has risen. Um, and if we look at most Chinese provinces, we don't see social instability. Um, so I think the story about brittleness in China's society, um, I think actually uh, is considerably overstated. Uh, and let me just take on that last question uh, from the audience about Cold War. Um, so um, I think if we went back to 1978, uh, when uh, Deng Xiaoping started the reform and opening process, if the US at that point had said no, um, you're not coming into the global economy, we won't trade with you, we won't invest in you, we won't share our technology and expertise, then that would have been a crushing blow to China's early reform ambitions. Um, and maybe the global economy today would look very different to how it actually does. Um, but here we are in 2020, China is the second biggest economy in the world, the biggest exporter in the world, an exporter increasingly of capital to many emerging markets, um, multinationals uh, here in the US, in Europe, in Japan, in Korea are deeply invested in their China relationship, both as a source of supply and as a source of demand. Um, so it's clear that there has been a change in the way the world views China. Um, it's very clear here in the US, in Europe, in other parts of the world, there has been a shift in focus from thinking about the opportunities to worrying about the risks and, and thinking about how to, how, how to manage them. But is that going to mean a, a decoupling? Is that going to mean a Cold War in a meaningful sense where economic ties are comprehensively broken? Um, I find that um, very hard to imagine. Um, so I'm afraid I didn't get to all of the amazing comments we had from the panel or all of the interesting questions uh, from the audience, uh, but I hope that um, deals with some of, the, some of the big points. And I'll hand back to Scott. Uh, terrific, uh, Tom. Uh, you, masterful, masterful reaction to some of the, the, the comments from uh, the commentators and, and the audience. Uh, I want to give a, a, a minute or, or so to each of our commentators, again, going in reverse order, Logan, Ann, Helga, and Joyce, to just uh, react to either anything that Thomas said uh, now or things that you've heard from uh, your fellow commentators, uh, and then I'll, I'll wrap things up. So, uh, Logan. Thanks, Scott. I, I'll just say something very briefly about the, the COVID-19 outbreak and the effect we think it should have on the, the financial system um, and financial system stability. You know, I, I think it's far too early to say that we've really seen the effects so far. Uh, but the other issue is that when government guarantees for state-owned enterprises for banks and government support is being extended, I wouldn't necessarily expect to see financial risk rise. I would expect to see that occur after, in a system like China where everything is assumed to be guaranteed, when government guarantees are being withdrawn and when uh, conditions are normalizing. So it may be too early to see when it's really after sort of China has a recovery and we get back to more regular regulation of the banking system that we see more credit risks emerge because uh, the losses from non-performing loans extended during this time will start to appear. Um, that being said, I'm also concerned about the, what, the risk we are already seeing um, within non-bank financial institutions such as trusts and even at smaller banks. Terrific. Um, Anne? I, I'm gonna to try to keep this short, but um, first of all, with respect to deleveraging, yes, that was a great story, but let's not forget that China has a $7.7 .7 trillion securitization market that isn't counted in that. So not to say that securitization is wrong, <laughs> I'm a practitioner, but simply to say that it was China's express strategy to move some of shadow banking into securitization. So there's leverage there too. Number two, <clears throat> um, uh, from my experience as a securitization analyst, I know that every, every reporting agency counts debt incorrectly because they count it on a, on a marginal basis instead of on a, on a cumulative basis. Cumulatively, the actual amount of debt by each country is somewhere between two times and four times what's reported. 
How do I know that? Because you count debt, you count defaults differently in securitization. I mean, defaults, not debt. Point number three, I am very worried about not just the fragility of China, but the, the fragility of the global economy because I see a direct attack on science. And I see that the way the, and, and my point about, you know, how you count defaults is part of that. The same games that go on in manipulating default statistics have gone on in manipulating COVID mortality statistics. It's shocking. But there aren't enough people who actually understand statistics to stand up and say, this is the right way to do it. This is the wrong way to do it. So the attack on science takes two different forms. From the United States, I think we control the sources of science. And, the, and in China, I think they control the interpretation of what science is. And I think that some of the, the problems that we see related to Hong Kong are, are not just Beijing, but Beijing coming to terms with an information culture that's foreign. Our control of science is a relatively new phenomenon. It's a commercial control. And the last thing I want to say, the, the, the other thing, I don't talk about politics, but the other thing I want to say is that in 2014, the State Council published what I thought was the, the best policy piece on capital structure. It's called It was published. It's uh, a few ideas about the development of a sustainable multi-tiered capital system. And that was going to be the way forward, but that's not the way China's progressing. And we do not have a stable concept of capital structure in, in any of the countries that I operate on. The rating agencies in the Western world are in control of that. And <clears throat> I'll say that, that that's enough, enough said. So I am worried about fragility, not particularly with respect to China, but with respect to the United States as well. And if both countries have it wrong, then we're all in trouble. Okay. Thank you. Uh, great discussion. We should, should do this again next week. Um, two points. One, uh, COVID is a success so far, but I'm with Logan that we have to be careful uh, before we celebrate, in part because many of the measures that we need now in China as elsewhere sort of do have ramifications for growth going forward. If you, if you stop dealing with NPLs properly, ultimately this is going to hurt you. So you have to keep an eye on this. An important point on the sources of growth. Yes, you know, there is the income level relative to other countries. There is, you know, tangible, non-tangible assets that the financial markets can work with. But there's also improving efficiency. And this country has a lot of potential improving efficiency in the way it uses resources. And SOE reform is a big part of it. So, you know, there is a lot of growth on the table. Uh, that policymakers can pick up. Okay. Joyce. Um, no, well, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of comments on the financial sector. So, you know, we've talked about China's global reach in the tech markets and manufacturing, the geopolitical consequences, but their global reach in financial markets has actually been very limited. And I think this is one key area to watch. I and mean, if you look at overseas holdings um, of, of Chinese assets, it's about, and for portfolio terms, about 2.3%. And so will China be able to become a more mainstream financial holding, I think is um, a, a, a key issue to look at, you know, as they come out of this crisis. And we are seeing China beginning to go into the mainstream, you know, equity and fixed income indexes. JP Morgan is about one third of the way through the process now of putting it into these indexes. But I think how they develop their financial markets, um, you know, is going to be one important determinant of, you know, how, they, how the um, future for China looks ahead. The households are heavily underinvested in finance markets. I mean, bank deposits are still about two-thirds of household assets. Stocks and mutual funds are just 16 and 4 percent. So a question on whether the financial markets will continue to develop as, um, as, as China progresses, I think um, is an important question. I think globalization of the renminbi is going to proceed very, 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 very slowly after um, the COVID-19 crisis. There is the whole issue of trust and how um, you, how and, and transparency and how and their ability to integrate, um, you know, as growth does slow down there. 
So I think that this is, um, you know, a, a key requirement for China going forward because they do still have a risk of a man-made financial crisis, um, you know, as all the other speakers have talked about. Um, and one thing that they really will need to do is see if they can continue to attract these kinds of investment flows as FDI has come down, um, as everybody is looking at the supply chains and uh, the greater need to diversify. Terrific. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Joyce. Um, this has been a, a fantastic discussion and, and, and credit uh, goes to Tom for writing a great book to get us all started on this. Uh, I want to emphasize uh, why we wanted to host this program um, and why I think it's different than for folks who are in um, you know, New York or London or you know, folks that work in financial markets. It's obviously very important, but I can't emphasize enough uh, how important it is for the Washington policy community to get China right. I think uh, each administration that comes in, as well as folks on Capitol Hill, have in their mind a, 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 a vision of China uh, as either a, a partner or competitor uh, that looks at how their views about how sustainable China's economic trajectory is, how fragile the system is, whether or not China's uh, economic trajectory uh, is a net opportunity or risk for the United States. And I think uh, Washington has been consumed by a, a certain kind of image of China uh, that looks at a lot at the risks and the downsides, uh, which are definitely there. But I think what Tom has done is add some balance to that conversation. Uh, and I think we would need to continue to investigate this so that uh, when we think about economic policies toward China and globally, uh, we, are, we have as accurate a picture as we possibly can. Uh, and so Tom, really thank you very much uh, for helping us develop that picture uh, today. Uh, and with your book, it'll have a very long shelf life, I'm, I'm certain. I wanna thank our CSIS staff, Alyssa Scherning, our interns for organizing today's event uh, and uh, doing a masterful job. Also to our uh, commentators, Joyce, Helga, Ann, and Logan, uh, terrific commentary, a great dissertation committee. I hope we get the band together again. Uh, to our audience for, for tuning in, for asking good questions. Uh, and uh, to everybody, uh, please be back with us uh, on September 22nd when we uh, have a rollout of Logan Wright's report about financial risks in China as well. This is a topic which is not going away, which we really need to understand, and we're going to stay on it. Uh, and so we will be providing more information about uh, that report and the event uh, in the weeks ahead. So uh, to everyone there, uh, wherever you are, uh, hope you have a, a good evening, a good afternoon, or a good rest of the day. Thank you so much for tuning in, uh, and take care.